Hey guys, welcome back. Um, today's video is going to be a little different. Uh, today I want to just make a video. I want to show you guys something cool. Um, I, you know, it's also uh, I'll be answering some questions that um, you know people have have asked. Uh, there are a few questions I get asked over and over that I just really haven't addressed before that I want to you know I want to go through and address for for those people and for everybody else. I um, also got to give thanks and um, you know we'll show you a few things here. Um, but the first thing though that I want to want to show you guys is something that uh, you know I've had this for a while and you're probably looking at this you probably say well it looks like you know you got parts for model 7 and a model 3 there um, but I've had this one here for quite a while I had actually taken it apart and powder coated it before and I didn't like the way the color turned out so it was stripped and uh, recently I just dug it out you know it, it took it all apart again and you know stripped all the parts and um, powder coated again in pure white which is like an off white color and, and satin black but you know if you look at the the neck on here this looks just like a model 3 neck um, but there's a difference and I'll show you right now this is this is a base and a neck from model 3 um, if you look at the the shape of them at the top here you can see there's quite a bit of difference in those. All right, so you wonder, well, all right, why is that? If you look at this base here, though, this fits right on this base here, and this is the base that it came with. This here is a Model 7 base, so you can see it just doesn't fit on that base at all. This base, this is an aluminum base. Now, if I flip it over, let's see if you guys can make out the writing on here. Right down here, it says model, and it's blank. There's no model number on the on the base of this. All right, so that's one interesting thing. But it also came with this plate, and this plate went right over there. And let me see if I can show you guys the writing on this plate here um, if you look right here you can see it says model 7b okay this is the motor housing and on the Bottom of that it says model 7B. So it's kind of like a combination of parts from different machines. It's uh, um, really strange. I've I've didn't even really notice it too much when I first got this thing and did it. Um, it was a little bit later I realized that wow, there's something really strange with this machine. So it's like a conglomeration of different parts added together to make a model 7. It's got a uh, uh, a different base here. Um, it's got a model three looking neck but the top of the neck is different and it's got a model seven you know the rest of the parts here are model seven um, the only thing I didn't like about this is if you look on here it's got a really crap casting on it I mean it's full of pinholes uh, there's some holes right there there's a hole on there and even on here there was I thought there was a hole on here this one isn't too bad but um, you know, it's it's pretty much just a crap casting. Um, on here, you can see right through the surface. You can see the lines on here from these from the bracing that's part of the underneath of it. So it's it's a completely strange sunbeam. I don't I don't understand it one bit. But um, you know, I've since it's been over there and the parts been parts have been scarfed off it. I no longer have the field coil and stuff. So I got to go through and you know, acquire some parts to get this thing put back together, but eventually. All right, so on to the next thing, I want to give thanks to, you know, a few people um, in particular, but i also like to thank, you know, everybody that's that's watched the videos and, uh, you know, comment on, and, you know, those of you that have given, you know, information, um, you know, to not just me, but to the other viewers, and I'd especially like to thank everybody that sent their machines in for service or restoration. Um, I couldn't, you know, I wouldn't have uh, 
I started making these videos for you so you guys could get a detailed view of your machines and that kind of uh, you know really took off to you know this is this is all I do now I, you know I was doing a lot of car parts and stuff before and I don't even have time for those now so I really want to you know especially thank everybody that's sent in you know all their all their stuff for service and and kept me so busy here um, I also got to thank a few people you know in particular um, I just want to say I got this lovely card here that says thank you I got this from Deb and Joe so Deb and Joe thank you for the card that, that means a lot getting little things like that um, I got this box here this is from Steve and he sent me some KitchenAid parts there's a new uh, um, speed control plate there's a new uh, bottom cap that, that part that the bowl sits in and a beater, a brand new KitchenAid beater. So Steve, thank you very much for that. I'm sure that's going to come in really handy. Especially since I've been getting quite a few KitchenAids lately. And I also got to thank Brian for this here. Brian saw the uh, the video where I was doing the, uh, the Hamilton Beach malt mixer and uh, seen where I had to actually make a, a part to, to remove the bearings on it. So he went, he picked up this for me. This is a 14 piece uh, gear and bearing puller set here. So I can give you guys a good view without dumping everything out. But it's got all the parts in there for pulling gears and bearings and all that. So that will come in really handy too. So uh, once again, Brian, thank you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, now, now I'm going to get on to questions because I know you know a lot of you guys have had some questions. Um, hey guys, all right. So as you guys know, I never show myself on camera because, well, obviously uh, for good reason. But um, anyways, um, I do have some questions here that uh, that I get asked quite a bit about, and uh, I'm going to go through. I'm going to read these questions and I'm going to go to a video clip showing. Um, or basically answering these questions. So uh, the first one I have is degreasing parts. Um, you know, a lot of people ask me, how do you degrease your parts? Uh, a lot of times, I, I use several different methods. A lot of times I use a chemical degreaser just because it's it's fast, effective. I can throw a bunch of parts in to be degreased all at the same time. But for anybody that's that wants to do this at home, there's also a really easy way to do it. Uh, you know, it takes a little bit of elbow grease, but not too bad. And you, you can see that in this video clip here. Okay, so now I'll show you guys, like I said, uh, an easier way to do this. And I've done this before. I've, I've degreased parts like this before. Um, you know, and I do, usually I'll degrease these and clean the inside out on ones that I got to, when I tear field coils out and everything, uh, you know, it's I just wash everything out this way too. Um, start by just getting, wiping off as much of the, the buildup of grease on there as you can. set it aside, the same with the next one, you see there's you know, still quite a bit of grease on these, and especially on this flat side here, sometimes it gets caked on there, and same thing with the shafts too, it's sticky but you can still wipe quite a bit of it off. That's just with a dry rag. I'm just wiping it down with a dry rag. Alright, so what I use is just dish soap. And I got hot water in here. Uh, a lot of times I, I, you know, I'll just do it out at the sink, but I can't really set up the camera out there at the sink too well. And I'll just take a toothbrush. And you just scrub it right on down. I don't put it in dishwater or anything like that. I just use straight dish soap on it and then scrub it. Get underneath the set screw there. And then 
You know, I don't know, I just rinse off with a spray with hot water, but I got a, got a bowl of hot water in here. There you go, it's like a brand new looking gear. And you can see where there's still some residue stuck on, on the top there. And if you got like, a lot of times back here you'll get it stuck really bad on there and it gets hard. Um, you may have to scrape that off. That's why I do like a chemical degreaser because it'll eat up all of that stuff. Now you don't have to worry about it. But there, that's a nice clean gear. So, let's go ahead and do another one here. Do it this way. I mean, anybody can, you know, degrease this stuff in the kitchen. And the shafts, they don't come as clean, but you can get, you know, the residue off, and then they have to be polished up mechanically, which, you know, I'll, I'll put that in another video as well, polishing up the shafts. So right now, I just try to get, you know, as much of the residue off as I can. Alright, and that is how you can degrease your your parts without uh, using chemical or anything like that. Okay, another one that I get asked a lot about is polishing up the shafts and the armatures. Um, uh, it's, it's not hard to do. Um, you know, it's it, anybody can do this as well, but and I'm sure there's you know a lot of people are gonna say oh, there's better ways of doing it or other ways of doing it, but um, you know this isn't something that I have a, a degree in doing. I just kind of figured this stuff out all on my own. So this is my method here. Um, you know, maybe it'll work for you, maybe you know a better way or or whatever. But hopefully this will answer your questions about that. Okay, so a lot of people have asked you know if I could show how I polish up like the shafts and the armature and all that. Um, so I want to go ahead. I'm going to do a uh, video for that quick too. Uh, I want to start with the shafts here, and uh, then we'll move to the armature. Um, I've got this little wire brush bit here, and you see all the things are pulled over to one side on there. But um, this I used to get in here as far as I can. I basically, get the crap that's out of there pulled off. that cleaned out. And then if you look on these you'll see there's quite a bit of buildup on the shaft part. This one is even worse. I mean you can see it's even on here. And uh, that stuff right there will clog up you know anything you try to take that off with. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to chuck this into the end of the drill. Sometimes these don't like to chuck in there well on this drill anyways. But there, now I got it in there. Um, and then I just spin it and use something sharp in this point, you know, in this case a razor blade. But I mean, you could even use a screwdriver or whatever to just scrape that crap off of there. You don't want to put it on there like this, you know, you just use that at an angle, just like a scraper. it took most of the stuff off there. Alright, so for the next part, I'm just going to take some sandpaper here, make sure you guys can see, and uh, spin it with sandpaper. See how that cleaned it up, and this I believe is uh, 100. This is 180 grit. All right. So then I go back with my 400 grit. Usually I use 320, but I'm out, so this, I'm using 400 on there. And you 
you see how shiny that made it. But if you feel it, it could be better. So I use uh, this is a chrome polish, but any any metal polish will work. You know, just get whatever the cheapest that you can find is, because it all pretty much works the same, especially on this. like really nice and smooth. Alright, now in here you see there's still some goo and the teeth are in the, the little rings on there, the threads on there. So I'm basically just going to do the same thing with the razor blade. Scrape out what I can and then I'm going to go Go back to the wire brush here for cleaning plumbing. But believe it or not, as you can see, works great for that. Okay, so that's shaft number one. Let's go and check out shaft number two here. Let's go through the same thing again. And this is hardened steel here, um, you know, chrome, chrome hardened steel. So, you know, this, the sandpaper that we're using and stuff isn't going to, you know, remove enough metal to, to make a difference on there. I mean, it's not going to change the size of it. It's basically just polishing it up. Alright, so now, we'll go back to the polish. to do. So what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to chuck it in with the fan side towards the drill. And I'm going to try to set this here in a way that you guys can see what's going on even though it's going to be difficult. This is, uh, this is quite a reach for me here to do this but anyways let's give it a shot. So you get the idea. Um, I'm having a tough time with this angle because I got one arm reaching under the camera and one above it. But anyways, if you do that, it will take you. Know, if you got a, 
if you got an unevenness in here that's going to be taken down, you know, just don't don't go at your super highest speed and don't put a lot of pressure on it. You know, just just slight pressure on there, and also you got to make sure that you got, you know, I try and keep it up against here, but I got a smaller file and, and it's probably out in the garage um, because you don't want it to like move over and hit your wires on here because you hit these wires, the armature is no longer any good. All right, so anyways, let's pretend that we've got this down nice and flush now. Um, I'm going to go through, I'm going to take the same 180 grit. And I'm going to smooth the whole surface with that. Then I'm going to come back in with the 400. up again you can see how smooth that thing is looking already and shiny but it's not done yet because I'm also going to hit this <coughs> sorry with the same metal polish now I'm going to reverse direction here on this thing Dry ride, dry spot on the side. There, and buff it out. Now, see that red caught in there. Um, now you can see how polished up that is there. So, Alright, now that part's done, um, we're going to polish up the end of this right here too and a lot of times it, you know this is like this right here looks good um, you know it's just uh, um, got a little crud on it there you know just like a film so if it was if it was really bad you know you could hit it that with the sandpaper as well but I'm just going to hit that with the polish out of my threads on the worm gear. There, now you can see how shiny that is. And I'll do the same for the other side here. But on this side though you gotta be really careful because of the fan on there. You know when you get this thing turning those blades will slice your finger. Okay. I'm gonna take a dry spot. It out. There, there's one polished up armature right there. I mean, look how good that looks. It looks like a brand new armature now. Okay, replacing cords. Now, um, I, I don't get asked questions about this a lot, but this is something that I know a lot of people need to have their cords replaced, and uh, they probably don't want to send it in and pay for shipping and, and the service just have a cord replaced on it so hopefully um, this clip here will show you guys that it's really pretty easy to replace a cord on there and, and give you an idea of how to do it okay so now we're on wiring up a cord here um, I've already uh, gone through and I just ran a green wire for ground up from the front you know, underneath the field coil and out to here, and that's what we're going to hook our ground up to. Um, but you see the old cord is still connected on here. So I'm going to cut that off. And we'll get that out of the way. And then we got some connectors on here that got to go as well. Alright. Now, 
get what's left of our old cord out of there and you can see why we're replacing the cord here but inner insulation is just completely brittle so that's not good so let me see if I can get the better angle for you guys here alright it seems like no matter which way I go I just can't get a good angle here um, but anyways we've got our new cord here, our new three prong cord here all prepped and ready to go on in fact I think I'm going to strip the ends of these quick before I stick it in there alright we'll just feed it down here enough to make our connections alright so we gotta figure out which one is our green wire here which I'm sure you guys are probably already saying you see it but I'm colorblind so I think I know which one it is but I don't want to second guess here so I'm thinking it's this one yep okay see I'm not that bad but always better to double check when you when in doubt you know so that was this one yeah all right so I'm gonna fold that one up out of the way real quick and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna strip these back a little bit here it leads from the field coil all right and from the cord I'm gonna go ahead and get my connector on here let's wrap that around make sure my connector is down all the way and yeah don't laugh at my crimpers here huh? my good ones still elude me but this works so Alright, throw our next, our next connector on the floor, and then we'll put this one on. Make sure it's on nice and tight, make sure the wires are in all the way. Crimp her down. Alright, that's all we got left is the, the ground one now. connected to hit the floor. There we go. Alright, all our connections are on nice and tight. Now we just gotta tuck everything in here nice and neat, make sure we have enough cord in there for the cover to re retain it because it's the the cover on here that that basically mashes down in this part of the cord and retains it in here. Um, but when you tuck your wires in there, just make sure that you know nothing's going to pinch them or smash them or anything like that. There you go. Tuck everything in there, nice and neat. Oops, sorry. I guess you guys can't see. I'm trying to get you guys a good view, but it's so hard to be able to see myself. Alright, put the cord cover on and find where the screw went. And then test your skill by screwing in with your left hand. Cord, make sure it's tight and you're good to go. Alright, oiling your mix master. Now, all the ones that come in here are always bone dry or they're over oiled, but normally they're bone dry. And I understand 
a lot of them have been sitting for a really long time. The oil is all gone and all that. But I also know a lot of people use them without ever adding oil to them. Um, so it's it's important to oil these. Uh, you know, the main reason is it's your main lubrication that keeps everything working smoothly. Um, the, these mix masters do not have oil wicks in them, so they have no oil reserve. So you, not like a Hamilton Beach where you, you can excessively oil it and then go a year without adding oil again. These, you have to oil probably once a month, um, especially if you use them. Um, so check out this next clip. It'll show you how easy it is to oil them and please start uh, lubricating your mix masters. Okay, for anybody that had asked or was curious about doing, keeping these maintained, um, you know, as far as oiling and all that, um, <coughs> I've already showed you how to clean this out and replace the grease, but, you know, at least once a month you want to make sure you oil these up. Um, and I'll show you how it's really easy. Uh, you've got an oil port right here and an oil port right here. Um, and depending on, on your model, some of them may have another oil port on the back here. Um, some of the older ones do, but we're talking about model 10, 11, and 12 here. Um, you've got, like I said, a little one here, you've got one here, and you also need to get oil down into the shaft. And you could try to get oil down here where this little slotted piece is right there, but there is a wick underneath there, and it's, I'm not so sure if it even acts like a wick as much as it acts like a, um, uh, just like a cushion for this shaft as, you know, it goes up and down a little bit um, as it turns. Um, I think it may cushion that, but it won't hurt to add a little bit of oil to that too. Um, this one right here is is probably the toughest one because it's such a small hole in there. So what I usually do is I just take something, I'm going to use a twist tie here, but you can use a paper clip or any small piece of wire. You know, you want to put it, put it in your hole. You don't have to go all the way down. But you just give the oil something to run down so it goes down into your hole. All right, this one right here, you can basically just put a drop in it. Break the surface tension and it'll run down in there. Um, same with this one here. Just put a drop on there. Clean up your any excess. And then on this one here, you want to kind of put it on its side. You want to lay a drop on the side of the port there. You don't want to go down into the shaft, the juicer shaft. You want to lay it on the side of the port. And you could do all this while it's running. I just had it off so you guys can hear me. I'm going to go ahead and turn it on so the oil can get everywhere. Okay. And if you do that once a month, you know, just, just one drop, you don't want to... Uh, put a whole lot of oil in there because if you put excess oil in there um, it's going to end up running out from because you've got such a tight uh, clearance between your shaft on your armature and on the, uh, the the bushing in there that it just needs a thin film of oil any excess oil is just going to run right out of there because there's no oil wicks in these to soak that up and they're going to end up down the bottom of the machine and making a mess and running out so you just want to put one drop in each of these and same in here uh, you just want to throw a drop in there, you know, just make it a small drop just to get in between, so it can run down between the shaft and the port there. And this right here, you just put a drop every now and then, and that wick will soak it up. And uh, that's pretty much all there is to it. Um, you know, like I said, only one drop. Use a lightweight oil, um, you know, sewing machine oil, 3-in-1 oil. Um, I don't recommend, I, I did see a video where somebody was spraying something with a, you know, like this with a straw spraying it down in these holes and I don't recommend doing that either just because uh, you can't control how much goes in there and you're bound to get excess in there and it's going to just end up getting out making a mess um, so I wouldn't recommend doing that and as far as you know like other oils um, you know slip 50 and stuff like that um, I know uh, motor oils like um, you know your synthetic motor oils mobile one and all that um, they're thicker than, the, than like your three in one so they, they're probably not going to be as good as, as developing a you know, film in that, that space there. I mean, I think they're designed to work more under pressure and like an engine. Um, plus, they're, they're loaded with detergents and stuff, um, all kinds of other uh, additives to it, which it, you probably don't want in your machine either. And as far as the Slick 50, um, Slick 50 is, you know, from looking it up, it's 75% petroleum oil and 20% naphtha, which is a, a solvent. 
and you definitely don't want to be putting a solvent in there either. Um, and a 3 in 1 oil has got less than 2% of naphtha in it, which I'm not sure if it's if it's used as just like a, uh, you know, to, to thin it a little bit or whatever, but it's less than 2%. And uh, the, the rest of, actually the rest of the 3 in 1 oil is uh, something called severely hydro-treated heavy naphthenic oil. So, don't know what it is, but that's what it is. And I know it's a light oil and it works well in these, so that's what I stick with. I mean, you could try other things if you wanted to. I would just be a little bit leery about putting things that are thicker, or things that have a lot of additives in it, and detergents and stuff into the, into there. Um, I mean, it may work. Who knows? You know, it's just I don't know enough about it to say yeah, go ahead or no, definitely don't do it. Um, but anyways, uh, that's that. All right, beater height adjustment. This is one that. Uh, you know, I don't know if people are aware of this or not, but there's an adjustment to adjust your beater height. You can have, you, you shouldn't have your beaters slammed down onto your bowls, but you shouldn't have a big space above and between the bowls either. And it's really simple to make that adjustment, and I'll show you how right here. All right, another thing I wanted to show you guys was um, adjusting the, the height of the beaters to the bowl. I don't have a turntable and bowl or beaters in here, but I can still show you guys how to adjust that. Um, if you can see, Right here, you've got like a square headed screw and a jam nut on there. And uh, you know, basically, what you got to do is I'm not going to use that, that's way too big, but just take something to loosen up your jam nut. And then once you loosen up your jam nut, you know, you can turn this square headed screw up or down, you know, depending on where you need it. You know, and before you tighten up your jam nut, you can check it um, on the, I know on the Model 9, 10s, 11s, and 12s, um, and MMAs, MMPs, all that, they've got on the on the bowl side of the, the, the beater on the bowl side here, the, the side opposite the juicer port, they got a little plastic tip, and that's supposed to just touch the bowl. Um, on the older models, their your adjuster's in the same place, and uh, you you just want that barely above you want that barely above the, the bottom of the bowl. You don't want it touching it, but you don't want it too far up. You, just, you want it just above the bottom of the bowl. So you just make your adjustments here, you know, and keep checking it until you get it right. And then once you get it right, hold your your square uh, headed screw in place and tighten down your jam nut. And then once you get that tight down, you're basically locked into your beater height. So hope that helped. All right, adjusting the speed. Um, I don't know how many people are actually going to attempt this, but I want to put this out there anyways because I know a couple of other people have asked about speed adjustment. So I'm going to show you how to make the speed adjustment on the mix masters here, and you know you can try it or not. Um, it, it's, I'm showing you how to do it if you if you want to do it. Okay, we're going to get the speed adjusted on this one here, and I'll show you guys how to do that. Um, I do know that it does require a small Allen wrench. As for the size, I don't know. I had a bunch of these little ones. I just kept trying until I found one that fit. But your speed, there is a uh, hole in the back here, and it's going to be, on uh, this one, it's going to be under the cap. Um, um, on a lot of them, you don't have to remove the cap to get to the hole. But on these models here, you do. And you can see the hole right there, right here. So this thing has to be set on number one. And we're going to go through, we're going to listen to the speeds. We're just going to do this by ear and uh, try and judge our speeds and also check, make sure we've got, you know, our high range on there, all, all our speeds, and we'll come back and we'll just make a little adjustment to it. Okay, so there's one. I let it ramp up a little bit. There we go. The tens, eleven, and twelves—they seem to take a few seconds to ramp up in speed. There's eleven, twelve, ten. So you can see we got into from ten to eleven. But we have no difference between eleven and twelve. So let's go back down to one. Put this in a hole, we're going to engage in the little adjuster pin that's in there. 
you see as I turn it clockwise it gets faster but then counterclockwise it goes slower so we want to slow it down just a bit let's go back and see if we've got 11 and 12 Now you can hear the difference as soon as you start going back off at 12, you can hear the speed reduce on it. And speed 1 sounds good. And that's all there is to it. It may take a couple tries going back and forth, but you know eventually you'll get it to where it, you know, you'll have a good speed on it. And also you don't want your, your first speed, you don't want that too slow. Um, if you if you have that too slow, the resistor in here is going to get incredibly hot. The slower it goes, the hotter it gets. Um, you know, especially you know with no load on it. So if you uh, turn that adjustment too low, I mean, basically what I usually shoot for is to have um, is to get it to where I just get a difference between 12 and 11, and then I leave it there as long as it's not too fast or too slow on one. Um, sometimes you know your governor will get worn out. And uh, to get that, you'll be too low on one, so you have to turn one up a little bit, and then you kind of lose a little bit at the end there. But, um, you know, that's just the way it is with, with old machines sometimes. But for the most part, you can get it adjusted good that way. I hope that helped, too. All right, and I've also been asked several times about the equipment that I use. So I'm going to take you out in the garage. It's cold out there, so I'm, I'm going to bundle up. But um, um, I'm just going to give you just a, a quick view of, of the equipment that I use uh, when I do, you know, the, the powder coating. Um, we're not going to do, I, I did a video showing the powder coating already, so I'm not going to do another video for that. But I'll just show you the, the, the setup that I have for that. And it's far from ideal. Um, you know, my shop needs a complete remodel. It was supposed to be done by now, but the bathroom had to get done instead. Priorities need somewhere to poop. So, um, anyways... Uh, I'll, I'll show you what I got out there right now. So, okay, everything starts right here at the sandblaster, and this is just a little cheapy sandblaster. And uh, you know, I usually have a, a vacuum hook to it to suck the dust out. And then, what I do instead of buying the films all the time, you can see how cloudy uh, this gets in here from you know just getting worn out from sandblasting parts. I just tape saran wrap to it and that way it's a real cheap and easy way to to just protect that film uh, or to protect your plastic and just it, you know you use up the saran wrap and it's it's dirt cheap compared to having to buy the films for those all the time and then this is actually you know I have a hopper underneath there I have the plug at the bottom so everything just goes back down into the hopper because I can you know I, I can get better feed um, with my media through the hopper and uh, I don't know if you can see in here, let me see if I can figure out how to turn a flash on on here um, no, I can't, so I guess you can't see in there uh, but I use, um, it's coal slag, it's called black diamond um, the, the fine grade for that which works well for you know aluminum and steel Okay, and then the next uh, tool I use this is a uh, this is my powder coating gun, and uh, this is the uh, from Columbia Coatings. This is the Hyper Smooth O2 LED model, which is a, an excellent unit, and it comes with the cool coat gun. Um, it's got different tips for it. That that right there is your regular tip with the uh, diffuser on the end, and it's also got the multi coat nozzle, which works great for doing multiple coats. Um, you know, and that that gets the compressor feed line goes to the back and it's got uh, this right here is your you know adjustment for your volts all the way up to 100,000 volts uh, you got your air pressure adjustment here with the gauge um, little LED readout right there so that's a really cool piece of equipment there and that's I couldn't get this stuff done um, you know and as good uh, you know as good as it turns out I couldn't get it done with that um, I mean this is for anybody that does you know uh, that does a decent amount of powder coating unless you're not doing you know if you're doing a um, like an assembly line production type work you know then you need to kind of a big hopper and all that but you know if you're doing you know just stuff 
you know, little little parts, car parts, and and whatnot. You know, this is a perfect gun, Fred. If you're doing quite a bit of it, I mean, it's it's uh, seven hundred some dollars, but you know, it's it's well worth it, in my opinion, if you're doing powder coating. And uh, this is the, the this come with it. This is this is basically just one of the um, lids from the one and two pound containers, but they turn them into hoppers, and it's actually a really neat setup because your hose hooks there, uh, your air inlet line goes here. That right there is what you know blows into your powder to you know puff it up, and then it of course comes out. The pressure forces it out out there into your hose up into your gun. And of course, there's the dust collection system there, which has a big uh, fan in the back here. I just I had to get a little more airflow. I was sucking way too much through these filters here, and as soon as they started to get clogged with a little bit of powder, um, it would start sucking them way in so I had to add a third filter up here that also gives me access to my big blower and the motor back there that's a big squirrel cage blower from a furnace but it it sucks a lot of air and it'll you know it'll draw all the powder there so it's not end up floating in the air um, it's you know a little bit more to clean up you know and especially on the floor down there you get a lot of stuff around it and then this right here is just something you see there's a ground wire there that goes to a ground rod outside and uh, this is just a, you know, a steel bar that I put up, you know, when I hang my hooks and and everything off of. And there's the ground wire that goes to the gun. And then the final part is the oven, which is used for outgassing and for curing everything. Um, you can see this is the control box for it. This whole thing was I built this whole oven. This wasn't one that was purchased, but this here is the control box for it. And the breaker's off right now, but. You know, I can use this to set my temperatures. Um, this switch goes to a light, and this one goes to a fan that I haven't, a circulating fan that I haven't even installed yet. Um, I've had this oven for five years or so and haven't yet put a circulating fan in. It seems to work all right for what I do, but if I ever want to, the wiring's already in there, and the switch is hooked up for it, and this is for the light, which, of course, burned out, but I don't use the light anymore either. And then uh, that right there is just a you know, clock and a timer. It'll beep you know, for whatever time I set it to. And let's take a look inside the oven. Um, this is a rack that I can pull out, you know, I can wheel it out. It does have wheels on it. I can wheel this out to hang big parts on and wheel it back in. But normally I just leave it in place and I take my wires, you know, or anything that's all my hanging parts off my other rod and I just hook them on here. Um, it's got the uh, <coughs> the sensor for the temperature for the, for the control unit is right behind there and this has three elements in it there are 3200 watt elements in it um, actually it's only got two right now because that one right there you see it's missing a chunk that one's burned up um, but normally this is over 9000 watt oven but I've got to replace that element so I'm only running at 6400 watts right now I mean, it still gets up the temperature it just takes a little longer but um, I will get, you know, I, I have that on order as soon as that comes in, I'll be replacing that. And the last thing I hooked up was this uh, lighting up here. Um, I did have a strip light, an LED strip light. Um, had it, two, two of the, uh, I can't remember, T50, I think, two bulbs that they look like fluorescents, but they were LED. Um, but it just wasn't bright enough, so these are equivalent to 100 watt light bulbs, but they're LED bulbs. And uh, I just have four of them up there. And as soon as the rest of this, you know, this garage right here gets finished with drywall and everything, I'm going to probably have two more sets of four up there. So I'll have a total of 12 lights in here. So it's going to be super bright, which is nice because it does away with shadows and all that. Um, but anyways, that's uh, that's a little tour of the equipment.